Sup Freaks, it's Marty here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I have the immense pleasure of sitting down with Charles Marone, author of Strong Towns, A Bottom-Up Revolution to Build American Prosperity, host of a podcast by the same name, and founder of a nonprofit media company by the same name, Strong Towns. You freaks have probably heard me writing, or you haven't heard me writing, you've probably been reading my writing about the book and uh, listening to my words about the book on the podcast over the course of the last couple months. Uh, it's an incredible book and podcast. Go listen to the podcast if you haven't already. Again, Strong Towns. Then go buy the book, Strong Towns as well. Uh, really, really incredible book that, that helps put things in perspective uh, and puts our current condition in perspective. Uh, we've, like I said on this podcast many times, we have a lot of central planners attempting to micromanage complex systems and Chuck does a great job of, of diving into how central planners have tried to micromanage uh, cities and towns particularly and how that's led to a lot of waste and uh, a, a lot of infrastructure debt, which is a big problem. We've got a, we've got a lot of big problems to solve here. Um, so Chuck and I dive into that. Uh, this is a very timely podcast considering the market conditions of our time uh, with everything taking a downturn. Um, uh, he's, we sort of get to the crux of a lot of the problems that we're, we're experiencing right now. So I think you guys are going to love this podcast. Uh, and it actually ends on a positive note. That's the one thing I like about Charles book, uh, is that it gives a lot of actionable advice of what you can do. He doesn't have all the answers, but there, there's a blueprint of, of ways in which we can slowly, but surely begin to fix the problems that we've wrought uh, over the last five decades. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by the Cash App. You freaks already know all about them. The Cash App is letting you do many things. All right, I, I said it yesterday for the rabbit hole recap ad. I was trying to think of how you could use your boost in these, these quarantine times. They have a DoorDash boost. So if you don't want to go to a local merchant and touch their POS system with all the germs on it, what you do is you, you go to DoorDash, you touch your phone with all your germs on it, you order some food, you put your DoorDash boost on, you save some money using the boost card, uh, and Cash App's going to let you do that. And on top of that, they're letting you stack sats. Or you can stack sats, send sats, receive sats, sell sats if you so please, right on the app. Extremely easy uh, to buy and sell sats. Uh, and on top of that, they're letting you send it to, to hardware wallets, to Wasabi, whatever, wherever you so please. Make sure you're sweeping funds on a regular cadence. Uh, and I believe they're going to make stats, stats, sats the standard, uh, very soon. I've seen, see Miles Suter, uh, um, tease it on Twitter. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard some rumblings that it's coming with an auto DCA feature. We shall see. Hopefully they drop that soon. Uh, and then on top of that, they're letting you stacks livers of stocks. If you're buying the dip right now, uh, if your favorite stock was just a little too expensive last week and still a little too expensive this week. Uh, Cash App Investing is allowing you to buy slivers of stonks. You can buy as little as $1 of these stonks if you so please. All right. Uh, and because Cash App is con directly connected to your bank account, there's no four to five day waiting periods. You can start investing today. All right. Cash App Investing is a subsidiary of Square and member SIPC. As always, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's one word stacking sats. And you're going to get $10 if you haven't downloaded the app yet. And $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. <laughs> Use the code stacking sets. Go to your local app store. Download the Cash App today. I think you guys are really going to like this episode. If you do, make sure you smash subscribe on whatever platform you guys listen to this podcast on. Give us a rating if you so please. If you're if you're willing to and you're liking the stuff, give us a rating. Every little bit helps. I'm trying to blow this up. We're going to be putting a lot more content out as people are living the quarantine life. Going to try and give you guys some quality information in these trying times. And I hope you guys like it. I think you guys are going to love this episode with Chuck. Enjoy. Okay. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that 
In a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here uh, from my quarantine zone. Uh, very excited for today's interview, sitting down with somebody who I've been writing and speaking a lot about um, in the newsletter and on this podcast. Somebody who's written a book that I've been uh, rereading, first book I've reread in quite a while uh, over the last few weeks. I'd like to introduce you freaks to Chuck Marone, uh, author of Strong Towns, A Bottom-Up Revolution to Rebuild American Pos- Prosperity, host of a podcast by the same name and co-founder of a media organization by the same name. Chuck, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. It's a lot of fun. I've uh, I've, I've listened to uh, to the show quite a few times, and it's it's pretty cool to be here. Thank you. That's uh, very flattering. That when you when you said you you were a fan of TFTC over email, I was my jaw dropped. And, uh, <laughs> I immediately started blushing. Uh, well, our conversation, you know, crosses a whole lot of areas, and uh, I think it's funny because you know we're sitting here today on a day when, and I just shut the ticker off to save my bandwidth. But, um, you know, the, the Dow has had, has hit one or two breakers and is down like 10% or something like that. Um, it's interesting because the, I think what you would call the far out, you know, financial fringe, the, uh, in, in some cases like the perma bears or the, you know, uh, predicting apocalypse people who have kind of been laughed at for a decade now. Um, I'm pretty plugged into them. And uh, not not necessarily that I count myself among them, but I think everybody else would count me among them. So maybe I maybe I should just stand up and join the ranks, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to, individuality is uh, <laughs> is fine. You don't have to be painted yeah, with, yeah. with a wide brush. But I do. No, yeah. I'm very happy that we're sitting down today, particularly because as everybody's worried about what's going on in the markets and what the reaction. Uh, from the Fed and the federal government is going to be on a day-to-day basis uh, for the next couple of weeks. I think what you focus on, what you've written about, and what your life's work is about really gets to the core of of the problems that we're experiencing today. And I think uh, to sum it up uh, in a sentence, it's central planners trying to um, micromanage complex systems and you focus on towns and cities and how these uh these these complex systems have been built over time and how uh, they've been sort of bastardized over the last five, six decades since World War II. Um, so I think for the freaks who are not aware of uh, Strong Towns, your podcast, or the book, uh, I think we should just jump into uh, the, the problems that uh, the po- post-World War II era, uh, particularly around expanding suburban areas and and not building cities in a very incremental fashion for quite a while has has put us in a very precarious situation well this is often looked at as uh, a social issue it's also looked at like as a planning issue um the one thing that kind of struck me back uh, you know almost 20 years ago now was how deeply this is a mess in our finances and by the time we got to 2008 and Ben Bernanke stands up and says, you know, the housing market is the stock market. I mean, the housing market is like the U.S. economy. Um, he was not joking. He was not joking at all. Um, you know, 25% of our economy is directly related to essentially the building of America, the physical building of America. And pretty much everything else is like a derivation of that. We've actually created an economy now, which is essentially like building itself. And I, I, for us, the conversation really, and I, I get into this in the book a little bit, the conversation really starts with the problem we were trying to solve in the Great Depression. And I, I try to outline this as being rational. You know, like, like in, the, in the Great Depression, you had this demand side destruction. Uh, you had people who could afford to pay their mortgage getting kicked out of their house because they would have three-year, five-year, seven-year loans with a balloon on the end because that's what local banks did. Local banks didn't issue 30-year loans. And so the, the loan would come up for repayment. The balloon would, would trigger. The bank would look and say, well, your house is worth half as much as it was the last time. 
we did this. And so you've got to come up with the capital. And people couldn't come up. They could continue to make the payments, but they couldn't come up with this big amount of capital. So the federal government stepped in and said, you know, we can solve that problem. We can solve that problem by extending out the life of these loans, insuring the mortgages, set up basically like settling down the system. And in a sense, create like stop that deflationary spiral. The problem is that we're great during the Great Depression. I mean, it, it, it stopped like things cratering. But after the Great Depression, we found that, you know what? Uh, we can really juice the economy by doing this also during, <laughs> you know? So when things are good, when things are normal, if we go out and have, you know, create a secondary market for mortgages, and if we juice the housing market and lower payments and lower interest rates and make it easier for people to get into homes, you know what? Uh, we can really, really juice the economy. And we can create these cultural, you know, cultural uh, stories we tell ourselves about the American dream and prosperity and what it means to live in a, a great country. And we can kind of associate that with success. And what we found is that for decades and decades and decades, if we just poured money into infrastructure, if we just poured money into housing, if we just poured money into essentially building, um, we could create a lot of economic growth. And that made us all feel really great. The problem is, if you look at the foundation of that, the foundation of that is, and we can just call it our cities, we can call it our local governments, we can call it our neighborhoods. The, the foundation of that is functionally insolvent. Um, when you look at the taxes that you pay at the local level, and I'm not going to sit here and suggest that they are low, they are in many cases bizarrely high. But you look at um, those taxes compared to what it actually costs to provide you the services, the, the paved roads, the sewer, the water, the drainage, the police protection, the fire protection, you start adding that all up and it's a fraction of what that cost is. The majority of that cost is being paid for by essentially the transactions off of growth. The more quickly we can grow, the more of this we can do. As we find cities struggling more, they start to take on more and more debt. Cities that slow down in their growth rates start to crumble and fall we all see this happening all over the place. The big story in Texas right now is that Texas is not California because we're growing so crazy. Um, uh, yeah, Texas is like 20 years behind California. Um, Texas will be California in 20 years. California has slowed its growth rate. And what you see is the cities financially starting to buckle under that. This is a story we see repeated over and over and over again. We have exchanged the stability and the strength of our cities, towns, and neighborhoods for short-term growth. And now that we're sitting here on the precipice of seeing that illusion that all that growth kind of dissipated in like one big stock market flame off here, um, what is revealed are cities that at their core are functionally insolvent. Um, no matter how you value the dollar or how you value, you know, if you just look at resources in versus resources out, we do not have the wealth, however you measure it, to sustain the investment that it takes to keep our cities running. And there's no one there to bail us out now. I mean, we're, we're kind of, in a sense, on our own at the local level. And, uh, you know, we've been saying this for years and years and years. Uh, there's a core group of people, I mean, thousands of people who, who are part of our movement, part of our conversation. But it's like today, as we see kind of these, you know, the, the, the Uncle Sam that we expected would bail us out kind of floundering now too, you look around and go, well, who, who's here to rescue us? Um, and that list is pretty small. That's it's very small. That's something I actually tweeted out earlier today is uh, you work hard, you pay your taxes year in and year out, and you expect... Uh, that when shit hits the fan, that uh, that will that will pay off, and, and the government will step in and help you. And the last three weeks is really proving that uh, it's, that's not going to happen. It doesn't seem like that's going to happen, uh, especially from the federal government. Well, I, I remember sitting around in Hurricane Katrina back in what was it, two thousand four? Yeah, I think my that was the year my daughter was born. I remember sitting there just watching this, going, "Why?" why are we so incompetent? Like, why can't we just do basic things? And, and 
you know, I'm not one of these people who buy into like, you know, oh, George Bush was incompetent, therefore FEMA was incompetent, therefore like the whole federal infrastructure response was incompetent. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, George Bush, the president, was kind of like the, the figurehead of this big bureaucratic system that is designed to operate like, I don't know, okay during normal things, but when things really go bad, which is when you need them, they're really not set up to, to, to respond well. And, and you see the same thing now with the CDC. Um, you know, w- w- we've kind of been at a, at a top-down level denying that anything was a problem. Um, we've been, you know, kind of I- I- inching along like, well, if we just kind of pretend the problem's not there, it'll take care of itself. And what you're starting to see now is the same thing you saw during Hurricane Katrina. Basically, the, um, the void left by incompetence and just you know, inability to be flexible and adapt uh, is being filled now by state and local leadership. In my hometown, you've got people out arranging like lunches to feed to people, and you know, kids are home from school now, and you've got ways to 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 get people food and get people uh, medical care and get people brought to different places. This is all stuff that we're doing for ourselves in the absence of like any competent people to do it. And I, I, I think if you grasp that, what you will recognize is that the strength of this country, any country, any civilization is built off of the strength of the block, the local level. It's not the other way around. Because we've got the greatest military in the world, because we've got the biggest economy in the world, because we've got the biggest, I don't, whatever at the federal level, it doesn't translate into strength at the local level. It's actually the opposite. When you're really, really strong at the core, then you're projecting like a greater strength at the other end of the spectrum. And I feel like since World War II, we flipped it around. We've got it backward. So you you started this with the Federal Reserve, and I feel like that's the whole, like the whole vibe here has been, if we can just make the stock market look like it's awesome, if we can just paper over all this and, and, and basically pump up asset prices, we can pretend we have an economy that is functioning. And, you know, the reality is the opposite. We, we need an economy that is actually functioning with painful feedback and corrective action and ridding us of malinvestment and, and, and making like good, solid, strong investments at the very base level. Um, and that's how you build a strong economy. And, and we've gone now uh, we've got 12 years of of paper phony illusion covering up what was prior to that, you know, a decade or more of paper phony illusion. And, you know, it, it, is this the final burn down meltdown? It kind of feels like it might be. I don't know. They shocked me last time. Yeah. I, I, well, I've been saying like, I find it hard to believe at this close after 2008. And I really think those scars are still... Um, very raw for a lot of people. Uh, I think just 12 years later, if we're having to do something even more drastic, the crisis of confidence in these institutions is going to be massive. Um, but then going back Ho- to the long... I, I, actually, I actually hope that's true, right? No, I, I hope that's true. The, the crisis of confidence. It, because I, I, I think, you know, for so long, we've just allowed ourselves to be passive observers of the system and and in a sense it, it's been a a des- i think a desire and i i understand it i mean there's this desire to say well i can continue to invest the way i've been investing i can continue to live the way i've been living i can continue to do whatever because uh, there's somebody out there who's going to f- take care of this the, the federal reserve will fix it the banks have got this the treasury department's got it the president has got it um and, you know, whether you're a Trump fan or not, or whether you were a Obama fan or not, the idea was that there was, you know, there's always like a, 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 a system, if nonetheless, that has got your back. And, you know, the, the, the analogy we've been talking about here internally lately has been, if you ever, if you fly in an airplane, they always go through that pre-flight, pre-flight briefing where they show you, you know, when the, when the oxygen mask comes down, Put your own mask on before you put someone, you know, your kids on um, because you've got to be like stable and taken care of before you can help someone else. 
And the reality is when 40% of Americans have a negative net worth, cannot make it past the next, you know, if they don't get their next paycheck, they don't eat. That's not a country where we're prepared to, in a sense, put on our own mask first before we help someone else. And how can you call that? I mean, you, th that is not a strong economy. That is not a strong country when you have that as the case. So I, I do think that we, hopefully the big immediate lesson from this is that large institutions are great when they're the byproduct of us doing collective things together from a position of strength. But when they are a proxy for us actually doing something productive for ourselves, they are the most destructive thing we can create. Yeah. And that's, I've been trying to decide whether these policies are just outright evil, right? Because the Fed policy, particularly since 2008, has. Uh, I don't think it's even arguable. I think it's definitely driven a wedge in inequality and the Cantillon effect has come into play where the people closest to the spigot of money creation have had uh, undue success simply because of the way money is created while the bottom half or bottom 90% of America has struggled greatly. And, and, that's a, and that's what I liked about the end of your book, particularly as you talked glowingly about your mother-in-law and how the importance of family and starting from the family and working out is imperative and that's one thing these policies have done over the course of the last five decades is really destroyed the nuclear family in the right. 50s you were able to live off of one income um but slowly as inflation hidden inflation started to take over you had both uh both parents enter the workforce and that uh leads to stress money stress and as you just described 40 percent of americans are living paycheck to paycheck and that is a huge mental stress uh on the country and uh, and so I think, like, how do we get away from that? Like, how do you, how do you incentivize more localism and and creating stronger towns and families? Uh, like you you said in the book, there's no panacea to this. There's you don't have like the correct answers or an exact answer for everybody, but something has to be done. And one of the favorite, one of my favorite analogies that I've actually been bringing up a lot uh, from your book was the question proposed posed by um tomas what's his last name sedlicek uh, yep, sedlicek the czech economist yeah mm -hmm. yeah so the, which the, question do we want to be an economy on the bike or are we going to be oh on yeah two feet yeah it, and it's, it's, it's really how, do we get, how do we get off the bike that's the question i guess exactly exactly um it, it's 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 funny and i think we can say this today with with credibility based on like what's happened in the last two weeks. Um, you know, there's, there's been a whole like Weimar Germany thing in my, like flipping around in my mind for the, for the last 15 years, really. And the thing is like, you mentioned the, the inequities of the current system and how we basically, and you could say this in a Bernie Sanders way, or you could say this in what I think would be my way of saying it, which is not a, a Bernie Sanders populist way, but it, like we, We've rigged this system so that, like as you said, the people closest to money uh, benefited disproportionately from the flows of capital. When, when I ex explain to my family, uh, my friends, how money is created, how, how the treasury has to buy money from the, 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 you know, the banks and how like this system works just to give them like risk-free billions of dollars every year no one believes me they're like no we can set it up like that i'm like yes yes that's exactly how we set it up and and no one wants to believe that um the tomas sedlicek analogy i think is is really powerful um he says we we can have an economy uh that is like a person standing and a person standing can run forward um or they can stand still and they're stable in both situations so you can make pr forward progress or if you have to you can stand and one spot for a while and things don't collapse things don't fall apart our economy today is more like someone riding a bike um, and when you're riding a bike if you stop you fall over it collapses um, you must keep moving forward at ever accelerating rates or you start to see instability the fascinating thing about 2008 was that if you look at housing prices going into that a lot of people think it was housing prices started to drop and then the economy crashed. And the reality was that's not the sequence of events. 
what happened was housing appreciation started to slow. So houses weren't gaining astronomical amounts every year. And that slowing of the price increases actually forced the resets or, or, or made it so you couldn't cash out every reset. And it basically took the, it took the froth off of that housing market. And when that happened, the whole thing came down like a house of cards because it was like a bike. You had to keep moving. And if you were going to stand still, if you're going to have two or three years where housing, you know, didn't go up by five, 10, 20%, but only stayed at its current rate, you didn't lose money, but you didn't gain money in your asset. The whole thing came down like a house of cards. That's a, that's a messed up system. And it's a messed up system when you get down to the human level. So here's the, here's the Weimar part of this. If you look at the hyperinflation of Weimar, and, and I think sometimes it's caricatured by, and I'm a, I'm a hard money guy. So like I, my portfolio right now has a lot of uh, gold and, and silver and precious metals. Like I'm a, I'm not a Bitcoin person. I told you that before we went on, like I'm not, and we could talk about that later, but you know, I'm a, I'm a hard asset person. Um, when you go, when, when you look at the Weimar episode, I think a lot of times the hard asset people caricature it as they merely printed money and, and what a bunch of idiots they destroyed their economy. And it was actually more complicated than that. It was a essentially debate or, or tug of war between keeping people employed. So you can think of that as like social unrest, you know, how do we keep people busy and doing things and the instability of having people um, not uh, gainfully employed versus the instability of having a currency that was, you know, running at high rates of inflation. And so it was this battle and it was basically like a political battle. You can think of it today in terms of like, you know, do we cut taxes? Do we deficit spend? And you kind of go back and forth and back and forth, you know, or, or, you know, do we do huge amounts of social spending or do we cut corporate taxes? How do we, you know, get the economy going again? And it's this debate over kind of the yin and yang. But the thing that they both agree on is they both agree that, you know, like deficits don't matter, keep growing the, you know, I know quotes don't do well on the radio, but let me just read this one really quick because it kind of draws to the end what happened in Weimar. Its perspective consequences of inflation became more frightening. The conflicting objectives of avoiding unemployment and avoiding insolvency ceased to conflict when Germany had both. So in a sense, like you say, how does this resolve? It resolves when there's no other course of action. And, you know, Weimar Germany had to, in a sense, uh, fix their economic system when trying to avoid inflation, trying to avoid unemployment, they essentially wound up with both. So they didn't have to choose one or the other evil. They wound up with both evils. And I kind of feel like, you know, what we have been trying to avoid here is this reset in our style of living, our pattern of development, our economic model, the people who have largely benefited from it sitting at the center, essentially saying like, here's your options. Uh, you know, option A is I get rich. Option B is, uh, you know, what is it? The heads I win, tails you lose mm -hmm. kind of scenario. And, you know, at, ultimately, um, I, I think that what what is going to happen is our economy will, again, start to relocalize. We are going to see a lot of these big systems break, break down, and uh, you're going to start to see a, a relocalization economy. And, and the question for me today becomes, how chaotic is that transition? Yeah. And that's the one thing that worries me the most is, is how, how much are people going to freak out? And, and again, going back to people really expect the government to step in and help them throughout the situation. But there are, um, there are positive cases of people actually making it happen. Like the, the forward to your book, um, is Absolutely. Santa, Cru Santa Cruz. Yes. Yes. Santa Cruz. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, you, you you have people, and I, I think the extraordinary thing about Michelle Martinez, who wrote the foreword of the book, um, she's an extraordinary person. And the whole homeless situation, I mean, her backstory is amazing, but the whole way that they've dealt with homelessness uh, there in the city, um, you know, and, and really been proactive. It, Santa Cruz is not right. It's Santa Ana. 
Santa uh-huh. Ana, yes. I, I was I was thinking in my brain, like, because I we're also doing something with Santa Cruz, which is also right now kind of on the front lines of the coronavirus thing at the local level. But it was Santa Ana. And the thing they did to deal with homelessness, uh, just very proactively, is, is amazing. Um, here's the thing that is extraordinary about Michelle Martinez. There's nothing extraordinary about her. Um, there are Michelle Martinez's in every city, all over the place. And what we have done by, in a sense, deferring our agency to others and centralizing things and, and basically not empowering the brilliant people like Michelle Martinez at the local level is, is we've robbed them of their capacity to do good and to make these kind of things happen. Um, I think one of the, one of the really dark sides of what I think is like the progressive experiment side of the suburban experiment, you know, the, the, the kind of progressive side of it, the side that has, has, you know, if we replace the, the, the family with a welfare check, um, people will be better off side of this. It is, is that you really, by centralizing these responses, I get the immediate compassion side of this. Like I, I'm not, I'm not denying that. And I don't want to go back to the Charles Dickens sweatshops and, you know, child labor. I mean, it, obviously that is absurd and no one wants that. But, you know, I, I, I talk in the book about my Catholicism and, I, and there's a big part of Catholicism that is deals with subsidiarity. The, the idea that we all have an obligation to each other at the local level. And I, I can say that it has a religious component, but I would go a step further. And I think it has just a human component to it. I, I think whether you are religious or not, whether you're Christian or Jewish or, or, or Muslim or, or, or have, uh, you know, Buddhist or, or whatever your faith may be, or if you don't ascribe to a faith, I think there's a deeply human thing in most people um, that is compassionate. And if it's given the, in a sense, the capacity to fill that void, um, lots of people do. There's a great book by Rebecca Solnit uh, called The Paradise Built in Hell. And it is all about how people react in the absence of large government systems during natural disasters. Um, and she goes back you know, a couple hundred years and looks at, at old examples. And then she looks at something like Hurricane Katrina. And you know, we hear the terrible stories of uh, you know, um, chaos and mayhem in Katrina. Um, but the reality is for every one of those, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of really human stories of people organizing rescues and organizing food and organizing all these things on the fly, not to benefit themselves, but to benefit all, everybody around them, people they don't even know. Um, humans have an amazing capacity for generosity and kindness. And in a sense, our system has crowded it out and reduced it to a caricature of Adam Smith. You know, the greed is good is actually a caricature of, of you know, the invisible hand, which, which I don't think can be read without reading the theory of moral sentiments, which really talks about the, the human relationship that we have in these transactions. So I'm, I'm with you. No, there's plenty of examples of... Uh the inst- institutionalization of dehumanization where people try to go to parks and hand out food and they get arrested for not having permits and stuff like that. And it seems right. that the, the system doesn't want this, but to touch on um, the point you were just making, I'm seeing this play out right now. I know I'm currently not uh, with my parents or my, uh, my in-laws right now, but uh, we're, my wife is obviously very worried and and wants them to come join us where we are soon, but they are getting taken care of. They, they live on a, on a block in on the outskirts of Philly and Chestnut Hill where, uh, they, the neighbors have decided to every day at 5 PM come out on their porches and have a social distance, happy hour, make sure everybody's okay. The young neighbors on the block are, are promising to go food shopping for, um, for my in-laws and, and other people who are of the age that is perceived to be more at risk. So it seems like even now during this crisis, at least there's one anecdote of that, um, which is good right. to see. It, it's, it's interesting because you see the, uh, the videos from Italy 
which kind of you know inspire the, the people out singing on their decks and stuff and you're like what a, what a beautiful culture and what beautiful people um we have the same thing here um i wrote in the book about how we uh, shovel each other's sidewalks in the winter and it, it it's it's uh it's amazing because you know the closest thing we really have to natural disasters here that occur regularly. We're not in like tornado alley. We don't get earthquakes. We don't get hurricanes, but we do get the occasional blizzard and we're set up to handle it. But the way you handle it is, you know, everybody kind of goes out and helps everybody. Someone is stuck in the street. You push them out. Someone's car can't start. You give them a jump. And there's kind of like a, I think, you know, a, a formal way to put it, but I, I think there's just a humanness that we all have where, you know, everyone has been in a situation where they've needed their car jumped. You know, everyone has been in a situation where they've been stuck and someone bailed them out. And so in a sense, we all uh, empathize or see ourselves as the other and everybody here jumps out just immediately to go help everybody else. And it's, it's very beautiful. Um, I think the way we not only get through this immediate uh, challenge we have in front of us, but actually emerge from it stronger and better and, and better positioned is if we can create these bonds. Um, at Strong Towns, this is what we've been telling people for, for years. Like if you want to do one thing to uh, become a stronger place, uh, go get to know your neighbors. As, as like, you know, uh, maybe difficult for some people as that is, or as, as maybe like, you know, odd or um, awkward as it might be, um, get to know your neighbors because when you need them, you need to know, you need to have some bond already established. And, you know, your parents sound like they're surrounded by beautiful people who are going to help them through this. Yeah. No, and as somebody who has lived in Brooklyn in New York City for the last, uh, shit six years now <laughs> yeah and, yeah and lived lived in like a compartmentalized ant farm like i there's i know in a building of probably hundreds of apartments i probably know three of my neighbors here's a fascinating thing and tell me if i'm tell me if i'm wrong because i'm from small town minnesota so my city is is fourteen thousand people um you know, half of them named Marone. Not not that many, but <laughs> I, I, a disproportionate number I'm related to around here. So I just I know a lot of people, and it's a it's a tight knit community. Um, I think the caricature that most of my neighbors would have of New York, of Brooklyn, is some like nameless, faceless place where people just flip each other the bird all the time and and yell at each other for budging in line or whatever. Um, and th there's certainly some of that. I mean, I've spent plenty of time in New York, um, but I do remember distinctly after 9-11 that there's a very, you know, New York aspect uh, of togetherness. And there is a certain, you know, you see it on the subway and you see it in other places. Um, I feel like New York is in many ways more of a city or more of a, a human place than even where I'm from. Because where I'm from, you know, most of the people here are, are very separated by distance on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very easy for me to go months and months and not run in, physically run into someone who lives a block away because they will go everywhere by car and I will go, you know, a lot of places by car as well. And we'll just never encounter each other. And in New York, you're kind of, you know, rubbing up against humanity for better or for worse at all times. I think there's something more human about that. Yeah, there's definitely examples of that. I think one of my favorites recently is is sometimes I think of Celine Dion was in town recently, um, and uh, all the people who had just attended that concert were going home on the subway, just break out in Celine Dion oh, songs, like in Celine the subway. Dion. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that ha I've seen many videos of that through many different concerts. So that's one example. Um, yeah, that's no, fantastic. I think it's. It's a double-edged sword, right? There's a lot of transients in in New York too. Um, who, um, I would include myself uh, True. as somebody who uh, I consider myself from Philadelphia, and that's where my heart lies. But no, you do see um, see the city come together when uh, when it's necessary. And, for, and a great example of that was actually Sandy Hurricane Sandy. Right, I was right. still living. I was still living in Chicago at the time, but uh, was. Uh, in town visiting my wife it was actually like one of the first times we did like the long distance trip and i wound up getting, getting stuck with her 
uh, oh, in, no way. in her two bedroom apartment during Sandy. But no, that was, she lived uptown on the Upper East Side. Um, and that was, if you don't, if you recall the, the lower half of Manhattan, the power went out and everybody right. on the, the upper end of to town walk. was, yeah. And everybody was offering, uh, people to come in and charge their phones and use right. the electricity. So yeah, right. there definitely are examples. I'm, I'm probably more cynical, um, just cause I've been in it for too yeah, long yeah. and I'm getting sick of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's, um, it's interesting because we've spent a lot of time in our movement, in our conversation, um, telling people that, you know, the, the craziness that they see around them can't continue. And so part of, there's a red pill, blue pill, part of our conversation. I mean, it's like, do you, do you, you're discomfortable. Like something's not working about the community you live in. Something doesn't make sense. Um, we can explain it to you, but then you're never going to see it the old way again. Like, like you can't go back. Once I explain to you why this strip mall is like bankrupting your city, why, you know, once I, once I show you the math behind why your big box store is just financially this albatross that you can't escape from, um, you know, once I show that to you, you can't unlearn it and then you will always see it and it will always bother you. Like it will, it will, it will be deeply disturbing to you. The reason we go through that with people and as part of this process of, of helping people understand what's going on in their community is because we say, hey, you've got to be there and be ready when people need you. Because at some point, there will be a dislocation. At some point, this illusion, this facade is going to come crashing down. And then we need people of sound mind to step forward and say, look, we're not going to go to crazy land to try to prop all this. You know, I can swear on your show, right? Um, yes. We don't swear on my podcast, but I'll, 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 I'm a Minnesota and I try not to swear too much, but we're, we're not going to, we're not going to go crazy land to prop all this shit up again. Right. It's not, we're not going to do that. We did that in 2008. It got us here. It got us to a worse place. We're not going to do that again. And so we're going to be like the adults in the room that are going to step forward and say, look, now's the time that we're going to, we're going to do this differently. And Oh, by the way, here's some people in our community that are doing it differently already. Let's copy them because they're, they, they're smart. They got it figured out. They're stable. Like, look, they're the ones who were, who, who, who kept their heads about them during this, during this panic. Let's, uh, let's follow these people. These people got it figured out. And I, I'm hoping, you know, you, you, you look, and I've read all of Jim Rickard's books. It was Jim. I, I, I feel like, I feel like there's a, there's a there's a Venn diagram that includes your conversation here in Jim Rickards. I don't know. Is that true? Uh, I would a little imagine. bit. Yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> so Jim Rickards, the Death of Money, and he's got this four part series. Uh, they're very interesting, but they're very good. His his thesis that I find very interesting is that the bail the next bailout will be essentially like the world bailing out the economy. So it'll be the IMF and the World Bank coming in, and and so. The Federal Reserve bailed out the banks and the government. Um, the next iteration will be, in a sense, the world bailing out the Federal Reserve and the system. And then after that, it will have to be Mars or something else bailing out the Earth. Um, you know, but, and he doesn't say that that's going to happen, but he just says, like, the next bailout will be uh, this. And I, I struggle to see that, you know. I, I, I feel like we're... In, to use 2008 speak, we're like 100% correlated. It's like saying, you know, in 2008, Florida was going to bail out California. Well, no, they were both screwed for the same reason. And, and when you look around, I mean, it's not like your, your you know, Italian bonds that were selling below, uh, you know, the 10-year Italian bond was selling at interest rates below the 10-year U.S. Treasury three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I mean, the, first of all, that is insane, even in a good, even without this thing hanging over our head. You know, that, that's insane. The, the rate of interest was insane, given the debt levels and the risk involved and all this. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at this going, okay, who, who is the world that's going to bail out Italy, China, India, Russia, Europe, South America, and the United States? Who, who is this? I, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. No, and the, you know, the, the IMF doesn't have a great track record either. 
Um, no. Well, and the, you know, the only, the, the only way, and I, I think this is a little bit of Rickard's point too. I think the only way that this works is if we all want to believe in it. I mean, this is, this gets to, I, I think what the best argument is for, for crypto in a sense is that, you know, money is, uh, uh, money in dollars, money in euros, money in, it's, it's just a religion. It's like a form of belief. Like I believe in this. And when you go through something like this, at what point do people stop believing in it? At what, at what point do people stop buying the story? And when you have the Federal Reserve over the weekend fire like the monetary bazooka, you know, like we're going to go to zero interest rates. We're going to ramp up QE again. We're going to start printing, as, you know, whatever it takes. At what point do people lose faith in that story? And I, I think when there's no toilet paper on the shelves and there's no food in the aisle and there's no, you know, whatever, they can give you as much money as you want. But like the story starts to become unbelievable. And I think the question really is, are we going to want to believe the IMF story so badly that we will buy into it? And I think what Rickards has said is that, yes, we will ultimately like all collectively want to believe that story. And so we will. And I, I don't know if that's true. I, I really don't know if that's true. No, I, would agree. I, I don't would tend feel to, like it is, but I don't, I've been wrong. I, don't I, was, either. I was wrong in 08. I mean, I, in 08, I, I thought this is the end. Like this is what, what we've been looking at. Like this is, I never dreamed that the Fed would step in and print trillions of dollars and everyone would go, okay, you know, like, oh, that makes sense. Well, I think there's a number of different factors between now and 08. I was a senior in high school when 08 went down. So that that is like seared in my mind uh, yeah. very strongly. And I sort of went to college with a know your enemy type mentality. Like how the fuck they mess up the economy like this. <laughs> right. Uh, right. And between now and then, we've had the the information age speed up. So the the avenues through which people can communicate these problems have become bountiful, and people are starting to to use them more. So I think just with the nature of communications technology now compared to oh eight, I think it is a lot easier to communicate that hey, this is not the right path to go down. I think more people are are being uh, are open to that message. And, and then again, the, the proximity uh, of the crises is such that it's like, all right, if we do this again, do we only have another 10 years of runway before it happens again? But, but that's happening on both sides because th there's a, you know, for every conversation like this going on, there's a, uh, you know, a group talking about modern monetary theory and how, you know, we can print our way out of this. And basically it's immoral to not spend up to our capacity every year to alleviate suffering and get people working and get people resources they need. And the thing is like people really want, let me, let me give you the, the thing that's been going around in my brain uh, about modern monetary theory right now. Cause the idea, you know, is that the way you control it, you, know, you print as much money as you need to, to keep things going. And if inflation starts to appear, the way you deal with inflation is you tax and you tax the money back out of the economy. And, you know, the, the advocates of modern monetary theory say it should be a very progressive tax. Like we should be taxing billionaires at like really, really high rates and people who are lower in the wage spectrum at very low rates. Um, tell me, like, look around now. You've got pandemic, you've got stock market crashing, You've got, you know, we will very soon have pension funds defaulting, you know, like grandma's pension is going to, is the only reason grandma's pension has not been in foreclosure yet is because those places were taking enormous risks to stay 70% funded, you know, like, like their projections were, we can stay 70% funded if we have an eight and a half percent annual return on grandma's pension fund. That means grandma is in a lot of risk right now and is getting creamed. So, you know, these things all go away. Imagine that circumstance. And then you know what? Inflation starts to spike. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to go put a huge tax on the economy. Like who the, who the F is going to do that? Like what policy 
What, what, what Congress is going to say, you know, oh, that, that's really good economic policy now in the depths of this huge financial dislocation where because of all the money printing, inflation's running crazy. You know what we're going to do? Just a massive tax to get all that money out of the economy so we can stop this inflation like that. Who, in, in, like, a, in like a real world, how, what politician would propose that and which one would approve it? Like, I, I don't see that ever happening. And so again, you're back to the Weimar thing I read earlier. You know, they're going to have conflicting objectives of avoiding employment and avoiding insolvency until they have both. Yeah, no, it seems like we're getting very close to that, and it's it's scary. It's scary. It. I think. I think people should legitimately be. You know, I'm not saying panic because I don't think panic is a is a really a good. I don't think panic as like a physical reaction is a helpful reaction, but if you're not a little bit like fearful and nervous about what the future is, um, you're not paying attention. You know, yeah. I, I, you're not paying attention. No. And going back to the ability of uh, these politicians to enact these laws, I think this weekend particularly is showing that that's probably not likely. They can't even come together right now during this, this virus, this pandemic to, to right. uh, give the markets what they want. And it's been pretty, it's been laid out pretty clearly by the Fed and people in the finance world like, hey, the Fed's not going to be able to do this by themselves. They need some fiscal, fiscal stimulus to go uh, in conjunction with the monetary stimulus that they're going to put out there. Uh, if they go out there by themselves, things are only going to get worse. And it's been right. a week and a half since the emer first emergency cut or a week since the first emergency cut, uh, additional repo, another emergency cut, additional repo. And I, I, obviously we've been having this conversation. It may have happened while we're here. I doubt it did, but it doesn't seem like the Democrats and the Republicans, particularly during an election year, are coming together to, it seems like ego is getting in the way. I, I think there's a way to look at this that is, is helpful. Um, because a lot of times we lament gridlock. And if you actually listen to, and, and just for the record, I have people who assume I voted Democrat in the last presidential election. I have people who assume I voted Republican. It just depends on like the lens you look at strong towns through. I voted neither. I voted third party last time and I'm going to vote third party this time. It, it, I think the way to look at gridlock at the federal level um, is that the, the things that they agree on are the things that are broke. And so like they're part of the, the lie, the underlying narrative that the, the lie that we want to believe as a, as a country, those are the things that they agree on. So let's, let's list them. Economic growth, um, you know, annual increases in, in econ economic growth solves problems. It makes life easier. Like Tomas Sedlicek, you know, if, if you're moving ahead, the, the, like everything becomes a lot easier. But if you can't survive a period without, without it, you are incredibly fragile. And the reality is, is that both, both parties, it, up and down the line from every politician, they all agree on a consensus that next year we must grow more robustly than this year. And the year after that, more robustly and more robustly and more robustly. They, there's no backup strat. There's no plan B to that. And so in a sense, like everything will be sacrificed on that altar. And I, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I am very pro-growth. Like I think pro-growth policies are wonderful. Um, but I would look at the local level and say, at the local level, if we can have a sunny day, uh, that's a good day. But if it rains tomorrow, the whole city shouldn't collapse and implode. And we've set up a scenario where every city is set up to implode on a rainy day. And so, you know, that's to me, that's not a pro-growth strategy. That is a, that is a foolhardy strategy. Um, they all agree on, uh, you know, American uh, foreign policy in a sense. Um, you know, our, our pre, the, the, the idea, the concept, and they lean into it in different ways and with different intonations, but like of an American empire, you know, America's role in, in the world. Um, the, these are the um, kind of core beliefs that are, in a sense, not viable. They're, they're part of like the big not viable lie that we like to buy into, that we've kind of culturally bought into. And I think where you see gridlock is, to me, not them disagreeing as much 
as them coming to grips with the fact that the underlying consensus does not work and they don't know what to do. Because, and, and I'll say this, and I talk about this in my book, I don't think there's anything they can do. I mean, I, I wrote this piece a few years ago about, um, I use the analogy of, of dinosaurs staring at the meteorites, you know, coming in. And, you know, the idea is that, well, how do dinosaurs survive this, you know, asteroid collision? And the reality is they don't. But if you're a dinosaur and you care about like the future, you should be trying to like seed mammals, you know, like seed the next generation of like something that will, will work. And I think that if, if our, uh, you know, national centralized politicians really cared about America, what they would be doing is they would be trying to strengthen cities, towns, and neighborhoods right now. They'd be trying to seed local leaders who can fill those gaps and, 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 and step up and be the people in place when they need them. Instead, it's about centralizing power and centralizing the levers of power. And if you vote for me, I can do, you know, these things from a top-down level. Oh, no, 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 no. If you vote for me, I will do these things from a top-down level. And the reality is, is we need to get bottom-up, and we need to get bottom-up really quick. And I think this is a good sort of transitional end topic here is the actionable things you can do. And one thing I like about Strong Towns, the book particularly, is it does seem like, even though you'll say you don't have all the answers, it does seem like there is uh, at least some some guiding principles in there. And one thing that really stuck out to me as somebody who has uh, my parents recently opened up a coffee shop in our in our small town outside of Philadelphia. And it reminded me of Jimmy's Pizza and High Point and how you break down uh, value per acre. And that's sort of a metric that we've gotten away from where uh, big stores like Walmart and Kmart may come in and be on the outskirts of town and big corporation may seem good for the town, but if you really look at the value per acre provided by those companies compared to the small, smaller companies in the, in the small towns, uh, the, the small companies really, really outperform them significantly. It's, it's absolute. And, it, and this is something that I think, um, again, I, let's, let's give people the red pill. So shut, shut this off now if you don't want to know this, because once we tell you this, it will change the way you look at things. So if, if I look at my hometown, we've got the Walmart out on the edge of town. Uh, it's worth $6 million. It's a, it's a big, expensive building. They pay a lot of taxes. There's a, there's a lot of sales tax that are collected every year. Um, and when, when, the, when the city council puts together their annual budget and their annual report, and then it shows up in the newspaper, there's like homage paid to the big box stores because look at, look at all the wealth that they're creating. Um, and it's very true. If you line up all the creatures on earth, uh, the elephant, the dinosaur will be the biggest, most impressive one. And you'll be, you'll be like, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's really amazing. Um, but if you go to the downtown and you start to look at the, the ma and pa shops, the little chocolate shop, the little coffee shop, uh, the little bakery, these, these little places that we overlook and we discount, um, yes, it's very true. They're not generating anywhere near the, the, um, the big dollar amount um, that the Walmart is. They're generating much smaller amounts. Um, but you have to look at it in a return on investment. That Walmart on the edge of town uh, not only has uh, a couple million dollars of pipe and road and sidewalk and drainage systems circling, pro circling the property, right? So we, we, we've got a $6 million property with about a million and a half dollars of infrastructure investment. But in order to get that too, we had to upsize lift pumps and do all kinds of stuff to provide that service way, way, way out there in the middle of nowhere. In the downtown, this little, this little coffee shop, this little uh, chocolate place has like 15 feet, 20 feet of frontage. It's nothing. It's like a tiny, tiny investment for our community. Even though it's paying much less in taxes, the return on that investment is huge. It's huge. It would be like, okay, what if you were going to go out and, and invest in company A, a million dollars? but next year you were going to lose $2 million. Okay, well, the million dollar investment is a big investment. Now, instead, go out and invest $50,000 and the next year you're going to make $100,000. Well, the way cities do it is they look at the big investment. It's like, oh, it's a million dollar investment. Yeah, but you're losing a million. Look at the small, add them all up, do it in aggregate. And what you find is that 
the, the Walmarts, the big box stores, the malls, the strip malls, the suburban subdivisions, the, the windy cul-de-sac streets, all these things have huge top line numbers. It's like when you just look at the revenue, it's like, yeah, great, awesome. But if cities look at their expenses and they look at their costs and they, 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 they chart it out over time and they look at what this stuff is costing them, every one of these investments is just sucking the wealth out of the place. They're losing money over the long term on every single one of these. Go to that old downtown. Go to that poor neighborhood where the poorest people in town live, the place that was around 120 years ago that now the, you know, the, the houses are in disrepair and, and the, no one's taking care of the sidewalks and the streets are all rutted. Start doing the math on that place. And what you'll find, almost always we find this exact same thing in those neighborhoods is that they're the ones actually subsidizing the wealthy neighborhoods. Those places that are paying more revenue per foot and cost less per foot to provide service than all that fat, flashy new stuff out on the edge. And so cities have the, the, cities have the growth narrative correct. We can grow by just simply adding more and more and more stuff. What they have wrong is the wealth narrative. They have wrong the productivity narrative. Um, if you don't build wealth, if you don't actually create more wealth than you're creating expenses, you can grow for a long time and you can take on a lot of debt in the process and you can extend things out and make them look great. But just like the insolvent company, just like the insolvent family, you will eventually go broke. And when you go broke, everyone in your community is going to suffer and suffer big time. And this is, this is the story literally of every city in North America. We have sacrificed our stability and our wealth and our strength in order to have that short-term growth. And that Walmart is a horrible investment. And add on top of that, the, the coffee shop where your parents are at, the one in Myler core downtown, um, that building, that actual building that they're in has been there 120 years. It was not a coffee shop five years ago. It was something else. And 10 years before that, it was something else. And 20 years before that, it was something else. And 100 years ago, it was something else. And I don't even know what it was. And it doesn't matter because that building can be adapted to different changing conditions over time. You look, look at that Walmart building, there's only one thing that thing will ever be. It'll be a Walmart. And in 15 years from now, when Walmart has a new location up the road, which, by the way, has happened once in my little town already, or when Walmart decides, you know, amid this market sell-off that, you know what, we're going to retrench and pull back and only be in places where our profit margins are so much, that Walmart will close and that property will be dead and we'll be paying no taxes. But you know what? We got a million and a half dollars of road and pipe and drainage and stuff we got to maintain all around it. And we have to maintain it because people live beyond it. So if you stop maintaining that road, what are all the kids who ride the bus who live half a mile up the road from that going to do? If you stop providing, fixing the water pipe, what are the, you know, 50 families that live up the street that require that pipe going to do. This is the disaster that we've created out on the edge of our cities. And it's a, it's a financial Ponzi scheme. And, you know, it, 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 the only thing that has kept it going is this illusion of wealth, this, you know, big, how do we prop up this whole system? Um, you know, I, I, I think just wait, because the, the thing that will come here, and you'll know how desperate everything is based on how quickly it comes is the big, huge infrastructure package. Here's $2 trillion for infrastructure. Go build, go build more shit out there. And it's just, a, it's, it's an attempt to prop up this Ponzi scheme. And uh, I think at the city level, it's, it's breaking down big time. Um, there isn't, you can't grow fast enough to take care of everything you promised to take care of. And that's ultimately the thing that is choking our cities. You know how I think would have would have loved your book and your your whole mentality. Who? Uh, someone has probably said this to you, George Carlin. I couldn't yeah. stop thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's probably true. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't stop thinking about his uh, America's one big strip mall joke uh, the whole time I was reading the book. Um, yeah, yeah. It's funny because you, you look at that and I think his humor is good because it, it taps into something visceral, right? Like we, it, it, it's not hard. Um, let, let, me, let me put it this way. 
I, when we talk, we tend to be, we tend to attract people from all over the political spectrum. And we tend to attract them because it's not hard for people who are progressive oriented to hate on the suburbs. It's like, oh, you're affirming my gut belief. But it's also very, very easy for people who tend to be on the conservative side of the spectrum to hate on the centralization and the top down and the way that, you know, those systems without the feedback, without the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of in the ability to adapt and change over time uh, really messes up systems. And so what happens is we have an entry point for everyone on the political spectrum pretty much. And then what our challenge is, is to introduce the other half of the equation to them. And that's always the, that's always the fun part, you know. We have a lot of progressives who love strong towns and think the answer is, uh, you know, the federal government funding more transit, more big transit systems and more big projects. We've got a lot of conservatives who love strong towns and think, you know, the answer is uh, build, you know, have the market build more McDonald's and build more Walmart. And it's like, well, dude, that's not really the market. You know, that's, that's not like a natural byproduct of like this competitive landscape. No, I think, what you really get hit on in your book, which I think more people need to come to realize is the best way to get out of this is to get out and fucking talk to people. Uh, you, you use the redevelopment of small towns. You, you bring a, a design iterative process to it, which I really like. to somebody who did some UX design back, back in the day, getting out and talk to people, learning what their problems are and then quickly iterating on those problems with small little projects if they don't work abandon them go to the next one yeah the tech people have really loved our stuff and it, it's funny because it 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 was not intuitive to me why until i started to ask like what would and they're like oh we love the iteration like that's how we work we do everything this way why don't cities work this way the idea of go out observe where people struggle uh ask yourself what's the next smallest thing we can do to address that struggle go do that thing and then repeat the process and just keep doing that over and over and over. And the amazing thing is that like one of the best places in the country for doing this is actually New York. Um, you know, Jeanette Sadek Khan and, and the Bloomberg administration, this was a big part of how they operated. Let's go out and let's just iterate and try things. And you can see where they were active uh, with very modest budgets, particularly by New York standards. They were able to make massive transformations in places that have really improved quality of life. So this, this is something, you know, it's having, having been trained as an engineer and then worked as an engineer and a planner. So basically work as a private consultant, but work for government. This was always like the bizarre thing to me um, is why governments had to act in, in, you know, why we tended to do everything in these big, huge top down like there's no small steps. Everything's got to be a big leap. When the reality is, is like everything in business school, everything in the rest of the world. I use, Steve Jobs is one I talk about all the time. You know, Steve Jobs said, if I would have asked people what they wanted, I, they would have told me they wanted a better Walkman. He said, I looked at how they struggled to use their Walkman and I came up with the, iP the iPod. You know, like that was the answer to their problem. And at government, we... We often look at local government particularly as being particularly incompetent, like unable to do things. And the reality is, is government at the lo local level in particular has some of the smartest, most innovative people, but they're handcuffed by a system that forces them to look up this food chain of governments and to position themselves at the bottom of it, in a sense, responsive to uh, what the state does or what the county does or what the federal government does or what the big developer coming in from with Wall Street Capital can do. When governments look at themselves in the proper role as a collection of us and they orient themselves to actually look at their citizens and pay attention to what is going on in the neighborhoods, there's an infinite amount of tiny investments to be made, all of which are high returning. And, and all of which actually make, make people's lives better, like make the city work better. Um, this is not a hard switch. And the places that we've seen do it have seen enormous gains from it. Um, I think yeah. it's really powerful. No, I do as well. And as a Philadelphian, I'm, I'm happy to see 
examples of what you talked about in the book come into play, particularly um, activating unused spaces. So in the spring, Philly will start uh, activating unused spaces and make them beer gardens where people can meet after right. work and talk. And right. my cousin actually worked at the Horticultural Society and, and spearheaded that for, for quite some time. And it was incredible to see that come to fruition and, and how it, it made people in the city happier. And you had people coming in from out of the city just to go to these beer gardens. And uh, it really developed a sense of community within Philadelphia and it still lives on to this day. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because once your eyes are open to this, none of this is hard. I mean, that's the thing you, you've said a couple of times. And I do say this book, like, I, I don't, I can't tell you the answers. Like, I'm not going to give you a, a five point plan to fix your city. I'll tell you how to think about it. I'll tell you how to go about figuring it out. And in, in the sense that that's a plan, it, it's a Um, But the reality is, is like your city is going to be different. Your opportunities are going to be different. The nuances and the culture and all this is going to be different. You need to get out and actually with intention, look at your place in a different way. Um, And I think, you know, that's a thing that we have struggled with for a long time. And I hope that with this transition we're going through with this reset that is being in a sense forced upon us, I feel like it's an opportunity for us to look at this anew. I agree. And I think we should end it there because that was a positive note. Let's um, end it there. It's a positive. It's a happy, because this is a happy, you know what? It's funny because I do think that there's a part of Strong Towns that is um, reflected in the current angst. You know, like these systems are an illusion. This thing's going to break. It's a big Ponzi scheme. It's not going to be fun. But there's another part of it that is like deeply hopeful. Like, hey, if we get off this, you know, this hamster wheel, like if, if we stop doing these really stupid things and squandering all of our resources on stuff that is making us poorer and worse off, not only are we going to be stronger and financially more successful, but we're going to lead better lives. We're going to be happier people. We're going to have better places. Like, you know, we, we actually will, could, we actually will be in a much better place. So I, I wake up every day, not pessimistic, but optimistic, even, even today. I wake up and I'm like, all right, how do we make this? How, how do we bring people along and help them make their place awesome? Yes. And I am very much appreciative for you getting out there and spreading your message, writing your books, doing your podcast. It's very important work, especially in today's day and age. Thank you. And thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this podcast. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, tales from the crypt. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I like the, uh, I like the whole concept and uh, we didn't talk Bitcoin at all, but um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, we'll just, we'll just say that I've, I've always been Bitcoin curious, but too innately uh, conservative to actually, uh, to actually do that. So maybe we can have a, a follow-up show where you can, where you can <laughs> shoot me your Bitcoin questions and I'll, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Well, we, we should do that. I, I have a bet with a friend of mine, um, and, and we had this bet a couple of years ago, but we renew it every year. Uh, gold and Bitcoin, and then what's the percentage change every year? And then based on that, we one of us has to buy each other a drink. So um, we'll see. We'll we'll see a year from now who's buying. <laughs> I've had to buy a couple times. So I I think uh, a lot of a lot of the Bitcoin gold conversation tends to pit. Bitcoiners and gold bugs against each other, but I think we're really after the same thing at the end of the day, sound money. And I actually, yeah, I actually feel like there's the Venn diagram has a lot of overlap. Um, it's just, you know, I, I, I think your faith in technology. I mean, I'm 46. I'm not that much older than you, but, but en- enough older than you were, you know, you were graduating from high school in 2008. I was watching my company go broke in 2008. Um, you know, so, so, my view of it is uh, is less technology rosy than yours, um, <laughs> and that's that's fine. You know, I I I I I would never say that uh, people investing in Bitcoin are wholly are, are irrational or doing something silly. Um, it's just not. Uh, I just can't hold it in my hand, and so I I struggle. And uh, I will help you get over that hurdle at some point. Thanks, man. Be- well, I don't know. I'm I'm bunkered in here now with the with my kids are off from school and I've got um 
what we're calling the strategic Mountain Dew Reserve um, <laughs> in the other room. Because I'm a, uh, I don't, I don't do. Co- my wife drinks coffee, and coffee is very easy to store. Um, I'm not a coffee fan. I do a little bit of tea, but I'm really a mountain. I like diet Mountain Dew. That's my drink. So um, I had to create. I've been over the last month like building up a stockpile of strategic. Uh, we call it the strategic diet Mountain Dew reserve. And um, so if you need one, you know where to find me. Oh. I got plenty to share. I will be hitting you up if I if I, <laughs> that Mountain Dew craving ever comes back. Uh, all right, uh, Chuck. I, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate you, it. You bet. Take care. Peace and love, freaks. Take care.